My name is Caratino. I'm with the ADB team. Um, Mr. Paletal is still on his way. I think he had a meeting that ran late or something. So, sorry, I ran up the stairs. So, uh, we've been advised to at least start so that we don't run over time because eating into lunchtime is never a good idea. So, um, welcome to the session on climate change adaptation and education. Um, and I, so I think all the presentations have been uploaded, and I don't have the bios. It's way over there on the other side. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So our first presentation, sir, you have the floor. Good morning, everybody. As, uh, My presentation is uh, based on information needs for climate change adaptation among farmers in Fiji. Uh, before the start of this uh, presentation, uh, I would like to say something that I don't want to point out anybody who is working in Fiji in this field. And uh, either it is government organization, they are also working for the adaptation uh, for the climate change here. So, uh, with this uh, remark, uh, these are the contents, introduction, impacts of climate change, problems for climate change adaptations, information and knowledge for climate change adaptation, and the conclusion part. There are challenges uh, for agriculture information. There are various challenges already existing. But uh, two most challenges which we have identified here, two of the such challenges are the lack of uh, agricultural information being disseminated to the farmers. And another one is adaptation to the climate change. Uh, as we know that uh, climate change poses a direct and uh, growing uh, threat to the livelihoods of people in agriculture who are in agriculture are related anyhow to the agriculture. Uh, and uh, poor rural households whose livelihoods <coughs> depend predominantly on the agriculture and natural resources will be a dis uh, disproportionate burden of adverse impacts of climate change. And this would be the focus of adaptation interventions. And uh, the Pacific Island countries, which are the most vulnerable <coughs> for this, and the reason is remoteness and the size. <coughs> These are some of the predicted climate change impacts on agriculture because uh, this is uh, the presentation which is based on the agricultural information. So what information should uh, reach to the farmers directly or indirectly and uh, uh, how they should reach, whatever information they require to adapt the climate change. Again, for this climate change, so there are, uh, if uh, the direct effects are there, indirect effects are there, and there are also social economic effects. Direct effects on the crop we can see, physiological <coughs> effects are there, morphological effects are there. If you see the indirect effects, effects to, uh, it affects on the soil fertility, it also affects the availability of the irrigation water, what quality of water is needed, good quality irrigation water should be there, but due to climate change there may be change in this quality also. There may be pests, there may be pest resurgence, some of the pests which are not prominent, they may be prominent and some other may be, uh, some may, be, may not be there the, due to the effect of climate change in due course of the time. Uh, there may be floods and droughts, there may be socio-economic effects also and all these uh, human interventions are needed, adaptation strategies has to be formulated, uh, these are already there but Something has to be done for local, at local or grassroots level. <coughs> These are some of the effects listed here. Sea level may rise 0.39 meters. For, this is uh, for the Pacific Island countries. Surface air temperature may increase 2.3 degrees centigrade. Rainfall could either rise or fall. Uh, uh, there are predictions 8.36 to 20. 0.2% and conditions we are facing. Uh, 
proxical cyclones may be becoming more intense, saline intrusion into freshwater lenses and increased flooding. These may be some of the impacts from the course of time. How they affect in very quick, if temperature goes up, then heat stress on the plants, changes in soil moisture and temperature, loss of soil fertility, there may be erosion problem, more erosion, then there may be loss of topsoil, that is fertile, less water available for the crop production. We, here we are talking about the quality water that should be available for the crop production. There may be height of water change, changes in the height of water table, and the area which are under crops, they may not be under crops in the near future. Salinization of the water, fresh water. Salinization of uh, fresh water aquifers may be there and loss of land to sea level. Because due to uh, sea level rise, there may be loss of fertile land. Uh, so these are some of the hazards which will affect agriculture. There are some problems listed which are uh, regarding the adaptation for the climate change. Uncertainty of the availability of climate information at the local scale. Informations uh, which are available, but uh, we have to think about the local or grassroots levels. The information which are available, they are complex. Complexity of the scientific information on climate change. We have to decode sometimes, like uh, if uh, there are certain information on uh, weather parameters, it should be read by the farmers. So there's a need to train the farmers. Financial and infrastructure constraints are there. Lack of uh, tailoring the information to meet needs of the local stakeholders or farmers. Non-integration of the local institutions. This is one of the problem. Then cultural practices and experience into actionable adaptation decision for these cultural practices. Failure to use media or uh, less use of media that is easily accessible to the rural areas also. <coughs> Information and knowledge needed for climate change adaptation. There may be no. Uh, there may be information based on uh, meteorological data or hydrological <coughs> data. Scientific information on that. Then ecological, agroecological information. Then socio-economic information uh, of the farmers, which are directly affected by this. One more important thing that communication of these informations, <coughs> communication uh, at right time, and the information which is, has to be provided should be relevant and appropriate. Appropriate and relevant climate change information has to be communicated to the farmers and at right time. As uh, climate change communication may be the backbone of climate change adaptation and adaptive planning if you want to do that. What information they generally need? Climatic information like warnings and forecasts. This can help to prepare rural farmers for climate change adaptations. If information are available at the right time, they can well prepare before any, uh, uh, like if cyclone is predicted, they can prepare themselves very well. Communication will not only create awareness but can also provide information and prepare communities, thus inspiring behavioral changes in, among them. Then uh, we can see in this slide that uh, climate information and prediction services enable better management of climate variability and change. If informations are on time, then we can manage them very well. Better adaptation to the incorporation of science-based practices into planning, policy, Practices on global, regional, and national scale has to be done. Enables uh, the if this information and knowledge enables farmers to take decisions regarding their choice of practices in order to avoid or reduce risks uh, related to climate change and promote sustainable production. Uh, we have done uh, a small study in uh, Nandroga province. That is uh, the main. Uh, you can see the salad bowl of Fiji, Singatuba comes from there, the main uh, city there. Uh, these, uh, this slide is uh, based on demographic characteristics by a farmer and some other gender, age, educational level and land types. You can see in the, uh, this uh, pie graph, this graph, 
this is the land owned, what type of lands and uh, how much percentage is there. Uh, this study was based on a questionnaire open, and uh, there were 120 farmers who were taken into study. Male, female percent is also given there and uh, age group is also given there. 38, uh, more than uh, 40 years age is 38 percent. 29 percent is between between 30 to 40 years. So it indicates uh, the age group of the farmers. If we uh, about uh, 7, 65 to 70 percent are above 30 years of the age. So it also depends. Uh, age group is there, then who can adopt the adaptations and who can adopt the things uh, for the climate change. Then uh, educational level, uh, education level 83 percent, you can see here, that's the primary educated. So education level is also important for the adaptation strategies. Okay, the need for the weather information by the farmers. 58% they strongly agree that we need weather information and 42% they agree. So almost 100% farmer, all of the farmers of the particular study area, they were agree that we need weather information. Uh, this slide challenges what challenge they're facing to, uh, for, uh, if they want to access the information. Need for more information and fund for construction of strong resistance and productive structures. Early weather forecast 25 percent and transport is issues are 33 percent in that area. TV and radio were the most, uh, uh, you can say, the best source of information on weather forecasting and accessing information in the study area. Farmers find awareness program also helpful. 72 percent they were agree that I mean, more awareness programs should be done so that they are very well aware of these things and they can adapt climate change. Information on input availability for crop production in study area. Inputs should be provided. 92% they were agree. Subsidized rate inputs they should be provided. So they can adopt climate change well. These are the, this is the last slide of my presentation. Uh, farmers of the study area, they require uh, clim information of climate parameters, warning, forecast. They can help to prepare farmers for climate change adaptations. The farmer needs information on production technology that involves cultivation, fertilizers, pest control measures, weeding, harvesting, etc. Uh, as the government will scale up, especially use of radio and TV in agriculture information system, which can help for researchers to disseminate and farmers to access information. Efforts should be made to increase air time. There are programs, but more air time should be there for these agriculture related programs. So efforts should be made to increase air time for agriculture programs on radio and television. These are also prevalent to media reaching most remote areas of the city. And uh, one last is uh, mobile phones. That technology can be harnessed for great benefits to the farmer. They can be made aware through these mobile text messages that this technology is going to happen. And they have to make up like this. And uh, monthly they can be provided information which crop they have to grow in which month how they have to grow in this month, what fertilizer they have to use, which weeds is coming, which weed they have to control, how they have to control. It's very good technology, I believe. It is being used, but uh, it is being used, but has to be, level has to be more. So this was the last slide. Thank you. I sincerely apologize to everybody. I'm supposed to be chairing this panel today. Um, uh, coming all the way from Tonga, you know, sort of missed the boat this morning. So I actually thought my session was at one. So. Um, but I guess it's a clear example of, of being, um, of how well we need to educate ourselves and being aware 
basically of of um, of our surroundings at exactly the right time to keep as well. So um, I know that uh, uh, the the formalities have, have passed on, but um, I guess we'll get on with the uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have the pleasure of uh, perhaps introducing to many of you a project that's happening at the moment and um, also hopefully updating some people that are familiar with this project. It's called the EU, or our funding, PAC for Pacific, TVET for Technical Vocational Education and Training. So that's what our TVET is. The purpose of the project is like you probably think many projects, there are so many climate change um, adaptation projects out there, uh, but basically it's looking at technical expertise. We're talking about education and training, um, which I know is the theme of our, our forum here and also relates to our previous speaker. So that's what this project is about. Um, it's a focus on technical education programs in the field of climate change and sustainable energy. The reason why the project was born is an interesting one and it's, um, it just makes so much sense that you do sort of wonder why it took so long to come about. I think now for in, in different areas of the world, not just in the Pacific, um, certainly here in Fiji and some of the Pacific countries that I'm familiar with, there is climate change in the school curriculums. The secondary education and even the primary <coughs> education sectors have introduced um, different areas of energy and climate change adaptation into their curriculum. There have been university programs for a number of years, perhaps particularly if we think of sustainable energy, where the energy um, university programs seem to have grown from the field of engineering. In climate change, the degrees in, at university level are just starting to emerge at a global level. So we've covered the school curriculum and we've covered the tertiary sector uh, as far as the universities go, but the TVET sector, which if I, if I say TVET and you'll see, if you, if you think of certificate level programs. So in different countries, it is between the secondary schooling and often university education. And then, as in the Pacific, as it is in um, our, our neighbours of Australia and New Zealand, the technical education is also in the secondary schools. So that's why this program came about, because there is a gap, and also we will see there are a lot of people out in the Pacific that have already actually undergone a lot of training that we would think would be at this certificate level. These are the short courses that have been going on for a long time through different development partner initiatives and also government initiatives in the Pacific that have already trained people, but they don't have any formal recognition. So they might have lots of certificates of participation, and lots of certificates of attendance, but they don't actually have what, what I'm calling an accredited qualification. The project, 15, the EU 15 Pacific Island countries. The project's been going for two years, it has another two and a half years to run. It's a 6.1 million euro, and it's, a, it's an interesting project because it's a 50-50 split with SPC, the Pacific Community, and USP. So I work at USP, but some of my team colleagues work at the SPC. I'm going to speak today about three of the initiatives that have come from this particular project. So they're listed there for you. If I go to the first one, which is the the big seller, if you like, because we're just about there. It, it's regional qualifications. We've worked with, over the past two years, after an initial needs analysis done in those 15 countries, the PAC-TVET project has worked with FHEC, is the Fiji Higher Education Commission. Now, we worked with that particular organisation 
to develop a certificate one to four, and we're calling it resilience. Resilience is climate change adaptation and disaster risk management. And I'll show you on another slide just what exactly that entails. And yeah, the word resilience is a buzzword and it's difficult with terminology in climate change to find the correct words, but, but that's what we're going with at the moment. So there are eight certificates that have been developed. Four of them are in resilience and four of them are in sustainable energy. The big one is that they're regional. So we did a, a needs gap analysis in the 15 countries. We found out what were the common needs and the development of these qualifications address the common needs. But because they're competencies, they're written in a language that will hopefully allow countries to deliver them at a national level as well as regional. So I don't want to get too technical about it, what, but the resilience industry, there are different strands. So these certificate one to four, uh, certificate one and two is in resilience generic. Once you get to certificate three and four, there are different strands. They are the strands. You'll find things that you might think of such mm -hmm. as, what can we think of? Waste management, um, food security. There are probably quite a few others that you're thinking of that you might work with that are not there. You would find if you delved into the content of these certificates that those areas are embedded. But they're the streams that we're going with at the moment. Remembering this is the first of these qualifications to come out. So there's going to be opportunities in the future to build on this. This is basically the platform for this, um, the start of climate change qualifications at a certificate level. In sustainable energy, the four levels, um, base, sorry, unaligned there, but the basic sector is level one, renewable energy, energy efficiency, energy planning and management. And yeah, you can see up there quite a lot of areas that have been covered. And again, sometimes when I've presented this in different forums, in particular an energy forum, um, people will tell you, oh, you've missed something. And as I'm saying, it's a, it, it's a start, and uh, yeah, we might have missed some things, but there's opportunity down the track for those things um, to be included. As you can see, probably from my language, I'm not an energy person. <laughs> I want to just show you how these qualifications have been developed. Uh, and really, the, the, the main point I want you to focus on is the top left-hand um, shape, which says ISAC groups formed. ISAC is the Industry Standards Advisory Committee. So if you're sitting there in another field thinking, well, I'd like to develop a qualification in my field, of course you can't go ahead and do it on your own, you need input from people that have the expertise. The people that have the expertise are those from the industry. So we needed an industry advisory group from the region, from the 15 countries. Because if we just did this in Fiji, then it would only be a national qualification. <coughs> So we need someone from Tonga and Samoa and Kiribati and Palau and FSM and all of the countries that are part of this project to input into this. And that was definitely a challenge and, and perhaps that's part of why this process takes so long. So the ISAC group for resilience is going to be huge. <laughs> You've already seen the, the, the streams that I've put up there and said there's some that are also missing, and now I'm saying we need 15 countries involved as well. So for resilience, it's been quite a challenge, and, and that's why I want to move to, to something that we've done that's quite exciting to, to progress this. For sustainable energy, it, it was a little bit easier because there's already a couple of regional energy organisations, 
and, and they're based here in Fiji, but they represent the region. They're called Siapi and the Pacific Power Association. So they were able to give us some good regional input, as well as we also needed people from those 15 countries to input into this <coughs> development process. I won't go through the process, but at the end of the day, what you'll see is that the accreditation is going to happen through ECAP, is the Education Quality Assessment Program, and that is an arm of SPC. That's a regional body. The ISAC membership, so it, I think there's a lot of people sitting here in this room, just your interest in this field and the fact that you've chosen to come to this forum suggests that you could be a member of one of these ISAC groups. The ISAC membership is a mixture. It's not just industry, because these qualifications are also for people in the villages and the communities. So you don't have to be in a business, um, and, and you could simply be a person with a great deal of expertise. So that's what, an, uh, that's what a membership looks like. Now the exciting part of this is that we're just about to go with it. So it's taken us two years. Um, we now have endorsement by all the 15 countries for the accreditation process. And, and that was definitely a hurdle because, again, some of you are aware that the National Pacific Island countries have their own national quality assurance and accreditation processes. So for them to agree that they're okay with our regional process was, was a huge achievement. Um, it may well be that the qualifications also need to go through some national processes for the countries that have got strong national quality agencies, Samoa, Vanuatu, PNG, Solomons. They come to mind as countries that have definitely said, look, we endorse this, however, when you come with these qualifications, we need to make sure that the national processes are aligned also. The Qualifications that I speak of, those eight qualifications, they are going through the final stage of being put up onto a website for final endorsement by the... The, the countries all saw these when they came face-to-face -face meeting in Nandi uh, in, in May, but they need to now see the final version of these eight qualifications, which will be through an online process to get this endorsement. The um, process is then going to be that the countries will continue to plan for the next six months on how these will be rolled out. And in all the countries next year, I hope, um, there will be some form of these certificates. It might be only a certificate one or two in um, sustainable energy. I'm not suggesting that every country is going to be implementing the eight certificates they will be through established training institutions in those countries. So they will be through, if, if there isn't a, um, a community college or a tertiary institution, then it would probably go through their, um, a community program that's often run through the secondary schools. So that's how it will be implemented. Um, this is something, as I said, that you might be interested in um, participating in. This is, this, this is the ISAC. This is what the ISAC for resilience is called. So it's Pacific Reg Regional Federation for Resilience Practitioners. So for those people that are working, remember, you don't have to be someone that's necessarily working in education. You could just simply be uh, in your community and you've got expertise. Um, so the PAC-TVET project is initiating this and we're going to support the initial secretariat for it. It's not yet moving. It's, it's in, the, in the process of being established. It was also endorsed at the regional meeting. So that was a great achievement again because that was another hurdle to overcome. And in my last minute, I just want to do a plug for um, recognition of prior learning. Uh, as I mentioned at the start, 
In the field of climate change, and I've, this is one of the reasons that we've been able to be so successful, is because it's a new field and there are a lot of people out there that already have the skills. And if they're asked to come along and do a certificate one in, in resilience as a basic qualification, they'll be saying, would you like to see the number of participation certificates I have for workshops and, and um, the NGOs that have been visiting the, the villages for the last 10 years? So we are going to really progress with the notion of RPL, which is recognition of the fact that a person already has the skills and knowledge, does not need to go through the training process. Many of you may have heard of this, and it often goes nowhere. In the, in the PQAF, which is the Pacific Quality Assurance Framework, in the Fiji Quality Assurance Framework, in the Vanuatu one, they all scream about Yes, we, we advocate, we support RPL, we think that all of the training should, should support RPL, but it doesn't really go anywhere because it's difficult. Globally, it's all, there's always been issues. It sounds great, <laughs> but then when you suddenly realise, oh, I have to actually do some work, I have to actually pay some money, and I'm not really happy with the person that's doing this, and on and on and on we go. So because this gives us a unique opportunity to progress RPL, because of the situation with those many people out there that have got the skills and training, um, sorry, got the skills, done the informal training, we really want to push the RPL and actually develop a Pacific, we're not taking the Australian or the New Zealand or the British or any of the existing RPL systems that they don't work in those countries because they're too complex and, and, and people don't support them. So we're really focusing on a Pacific model and, and a model that will start with the Certificate 1 and recognise the, the people that are already there with the skills. And this is particularly in climate change, in, sorry, in resilience, uh, because there's no licensing requirements as there will be in the energy sector. So it allows us to, to not have to have that rigidity. Thank you. Any questions later um, on this would be great. I'm going to just take over some of the chair duties. Um, before we introduce Dr. Tess Martin, I'm sure you've, you've read um, her, her bio here, but um, has worked in the TVET field for more than 25 years. Her work includes academic director at TAFE Colleges in Australia, Principal of the Kiribati Kiribati Institute of Technology and has an academic in the School of Education at both FNU and USP. She's currently working on the TVEC program at USP, um, developing qualifications as a presentation uh, attested to. Her research interests include policy and practice in the TVEC um, and quality assurance. So thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I'll also take this opportunity to introduce uh, Dr. Shifra Shah. Well, thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Morgan Wairu, and I'm with the Pacific Center for Environment and Sustainable Development, also working with Tess Martin. I think those the, the two talks this morning are interrelated, because Tess has just talked about the PACTIVEC training at the Community of Practitioners, and my talk this morning will be uh, on the tertiary level training for uh, students in climate change. As we all know, climate change is an important issue for us in the Pacific, and therefore capacity building in all areas, right across the whole spectrum from community right up to policy and people working on strategies and planning processes in government as well as in the other different sectors are important so that we can all work together to bring about the most important plans and development to address climate change in the region. Uh, my presentation will be centered on a particular workshop that we conducted last year uh, in collaboration with the uh, Melbourne University 
as well as the University of Barcelona in Spain and the University of the Pacific, just to build the capacity of some of our postgrad students who were part of the Pacific delegates to the Paris, uh, Paris uh, COP21 uh, conference in, in Paris last year. So it was a joint effort between the three, three universities uh, funded by the PaceNet Plus uh, funding from the EU. But just before uh, I discuss the details of what actually happened during that, what that particular training, uh, if I might sidetrack and go back to the background to the program that we offered here at USP. Uh, we started in 2010 with the postcard program. We targeted mostly uh, people working in government as well as in other private and uh, uh, NGO sectors who are already working on policy, strategies, planning, as well as doing actual work, adaptation work in the field. So these are people that we target in offering the postcard program. Thanks to the Australian government, who supported us initially in 2010 to start the climate change program. And uh, so far, we've been successfully uh, delivered the program. And uh, currently, we have a quite substantial amount, number of students enrolling in the program. And also, thanks to the EU, as well as the USA uh, funding to continue to support the program. So in terms of enrollment in our program by nationality, it covers right across the Pacific, mostly Fiji, Solomon Islands, Samoa, Tonga, Tuvalu, Vanuatu and Palau, and other international countries as well, including some of the countries who are not members of the USP, including FSM, Papua New Guinea, and the other countries, as far as the Caribbean and Indian Ocean. So currently, as of 2000. 15, we've graduated 135 postgrad diploma students and 25 master students, and we are looking to graduate our first PhD student this year. So that's been the, the path we've been taking so far since 2010. So far, most of our graduates have gone back to their places of work, into the government departments, NGOs, as well as some of the private sectors. And we have some of them who have elevated in terms of their participation in the whole climate change negotiations. So we have one of our former students, in fact two, uh, one from Fiji and one from Palau, who at one stage have become chief negotiator, <coughs> one of the negotiating block in the climate change negotiations, with it, which is AOC. So that's how far some of our graduate students have went in terms of their using their capacity their skills and their knowledge which they've acquired through our program. And because of that recognition of the important role that most of our graduates have played in their respective governments in terms of the UN process and the COP negotiations, we thought that we can add a little bit of extra input into their capacity building in that area. And that's the reason why last year we started the, the training for the COP negotiations. So we joined forces with the University of Melbourne, and the University of Barcelona, through the EU funding for PaceNet. And we trained some of our postgrad students who we've selected to be part of the Pacific Island delegations to the Paris negotiations during COP21. But before we can do that, we thought that it would be more practical to bring in also practitioners from the field, as well as some of our representatives from us regional organizations, as well as some of uh, participants from uh, other NGO sectors to come together to brainstorm on what exactly do we need to put together in terms of the materials that will equip our students to be able to actively participate during the COP negotiations. So the project itself uh, was really a, a nexus between research and practice. We want to bring the real stories on the ground so that the students can equip themselves with what is act actually happening on the ground and be able to share with their government delegates 
during the negotiations, during the core process. So that's how we built that dialogue between the students as well as the different practitioners in the field. And because we employed the use of participatory action research, it sort of provides the platform for all the practical realities of the ground to be filtered through the whole negotiation process so that we bring stories that reflect reality on the ground to the floor of the negotiation table. So in July, we started the formative research phase where we bring together all the practitioners as well as some of our students into the uh, analytical process as well as the action research phase. And then we move on into the actual workshop training in Suva, which we conducted in November 2015. Again, we, we try to ensure that the students better understand the negotiation process at the COP. And at the same time, we bring in the, the documents that the Pacific Island countries and delegates uh, equipped with to negotiate at the COP21. Uh, and that is the Suva Declaration, which was put together under the PIDF uh, Forum last year, as well as the Pacific Island Forum Secretary uh, Declaration of Climate Change that was endorsed by leaders in Port Mosby uh, sometimes in September, September last year as well. And at the same time, we bring in the negotiation text that was supposed to be negotiated at the Paris uh, COP21. So all the, those documents were brought together so that the students were able to know exactly what the content of those position papers, as well as, as, well as to understand the, the details as to how they can negotiate and assist delegates from their respective countries to strengthen their voice at the COP21. So these following slides that I'm going to share with you are just how we conduct the actual training on the ground with, the, with, with our postgrad students. So it's more or less not only on the core process, but we bring in the storage from the ground. We interact with some of our media and communication people so that they can provide the skills that they require to be at the core so that they can interact with all the other delegates as well as interact with other news media and communication out uh, areas within the whole COP process. So again, this is part of the training. Students were taught negotiation skills as well as better communication uh, skills to be able to bring home the message that we want to share with the rest of the world in terms of our negotiation at COP21. And all the training have involved TV, radio, and how we can package key messages and how we can tell our story that is convincing to the negotiators during the whole COP process. And of course, at the COP, we need that whole team building exercise so that the Pacific delegates and all people coming from the Pacific can speak with one voice. And we all witnessed this during the COP process which resulted in the Paris Agreement. And also, how the information, the process of the negotiation can be also be filtered back to those on the ground so that they can report on the processes as well as the uh, negotiation progress within the core process. And here we have some of our team members with their own country delegates at the Paris uh, meeting in, during uh, this December last year. So what happened is we, when we train our students, we actually delegate them to the country delegates. So each student is attached to one country delegate. So they travel as country delegate to the negotiations. At the same time, we have a backup team here in uh, on the ground to support them all the way throughout the process. So the outcome, well, we thought that it contributed some strong voice to the Pacific Island countries at the COP21 in Paris. The participatory action research based leadership training has provided some skills to the students. And we do hope that this project will be of interest to our organizations who are also trying to build some of their members in terms of the whole 
uh, of negotiations. And out of this training, lessons learned, feedback we get from our students, we put that together in a general article, which we submitted for publication to the Journal of Environmental Education. And thank you very much. Thank you, Morgan. I don't think we need any uh, formal introductions. I think your presentation uh, has shown us your contribution to education in the city. Um, still catching up with my chair duties. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Sherpa as our last week today. But before that, Sherpa, I'd just like to um, recap and catch up and, and reintroduce the person that opened up the um, the session for us, um, Dr. Herdesh Kumar Sashan. Thank you. Is presently working as the assistant professor in head department of crop production, college of agriculture, fisheries, and forestry at the Fiji National University. For more than seven years of relevant research and teaching experience while working on different aspects of integrated farming systems. He has offered more than 30 publications. He served as assistant <coughs> professor from March 2009 to 2012 in India. Postdoctoral follow, his work in research projects which, fo which has focused on agricultural production, organic farming, and weeding. So um, apologies for that late introduction. Our next speaker, of course, is Ms. Sherpa Shah, a lecturer at the uh, CG National University. She is a forester with a background spanning silviculture, ecology, and climate change. She has worked on carbon stock, land use change, community structure, and medicinal plants in the Western Himalayas. Currently, she is involved in research projects on nutrient dynamics in tropical forests, carbon sequestration in pine plantations, and anthropogenic disturbance of mangrove ecosystems. She is also a member of the Pacific Island Development Forum Committee on Agriculture and Forestry, preparing the roadmap for the Climate Change Conference in Paris. Please welcome Ms. Shumashan. Bula, I'm here to deliver a presentation on the topic policy initiatives to promote climate smart production systems. Unfortunately, my co-presenters could not be here. Nevertheless, uh, uh, I will first be discussing the two main challenges that are faced by the Pacific community. The first, first challenge is uh, food security, and the second uh, challenge is climate change. Uh, and then we'll be talking about how can we address these issues of food security and uh, climate change impact on agriculture uh, through agroforestry. So uh, let me first start with what is actually meant by food security. So food security exists when uh, people have access to uh, sufficient, uh, safe, and nutritious food which can meet their dietary requirements on the one hand and can also cater to their food preferences on the other hand. Uh, now, there are uh, five uh, major pillars of food security. The first pillar is the adequacy pillar. The second is called the availability pillar. The third pillar is the stability pillar. Number four is utilization. And the last is safety and nutrition. Now, uh, let me first talk about the food production uh, aspect of the Pacific Island countries. This is also referred to as the adequacy pillar. Now, uh, if we have a look at uh, the food production index scenario across the Pacific, then uh, we can clearly see that uh, uh, starting from 1960s right up to 2008, there has been a decline in the food production index across most of the countries of the Pacific. Looking at Fiji, uh, there has been a decline in the food production index of Fiji as well. Uh, another important point to be noticed is that uh, most of the increase in food production that we talk about here in the Pacific uh, is mainly because of area expansion. Okay? And we need to ask, ourselves, ask ourselves the question, area expansion at the cost of the natural forest? Or is it uh, area expansion in other terms? Okay? So it's not about actual increase in yield. The yields are not actually increasing. It's about area expansion. And uh, also another trend which has been observed is that over the last uh, 50 years, there has been a, a general stagnation in the agricultural productivity. Uh, if we talk about the present state of Pacific food security, then uh, taking the case of uh, Fiji, Samoa, and Tuvalu, all have recorded a negative growth in agriculture in the 2000s. 
As you can see here, the, <coughs> uh, the case of Fiji. The share of agriculture in the total GDP starting from 1990s to 2008 also shows a decline across all the countries of the Pacific. And uh, again, in Fiji, there has been a decline in the contribution of agriculture to GDP by around 3.6%. <coughs> Now let's talk about the second pillar of food security, which is the availability pillar. This focuses on food consumption patterns across the Pacific. Uh, if we have a look at the, uh, at, the, at the pattern of food consumption, then we find that there has been a major shift from uh, the traditional Pacific diets to, uh, to imported food. Now we talk about supermarkets, and it's less about uh, going to the, the, the local market and buying products from there. Even though we have uh, fishes there in the local markets, there are people buying canned tuna and canned mackerel and stuff like that. So that's a change in the dietary pattern of the people and their food consumption preferences. Again, we need to ask ourselves the question, why? And what can we do about it? Uh, there are certain uh, factors which are responsible for this change in the food pre uh, preferences of the people. Uh, the first is, of course, which is the root cause of all global problems in Earth, that's population growth. Number two is uh, a decline in sustainable traditional farming patterns. Number three is urbanization. Number four is an increasing preference for cheaper imported foods. Now, most of the countries that participate there, uh, if you compare the Figi index, you find that, uh, well, the, the, the food imports far exceed the food exports. So this is one tricky scenario we need to actually change. That is the import should, we have to uh, decrease the dependency on uh, imports and increase our export capabilities, particularly with respect to agriculture. Uh, the next pillar is the utilization pillar, which focuses on health and nutrition. Now, uh, people in the Pacific are facing uh, problems of obesity and uh, problems related to non other non-communicable diseases. This again uh, talks about a change in, well, the lifestyle of people and their preferences for imported foods. And the last is the stability pillar, which focuses on environmental sustainability. It says that uh, the traditional food production systems have been partly replaced by more modern food production systems. Uh, well, I'll come to that point later. Let me first talk about the vulnerability of the PICTs. Now, PICT is among the most vulnerable countries of the world to the adverse impacts of climate change. One would be, of course, the high altitude, the Alps, and the, uh, the, 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 the Andes, and the Himalayas, of course. But the other would be the island ecosystems. Why? Because a sea level rise, a minor sea level rise, would bring about major re repercussions on, uh, these, uh, on, the, on the survival of the island ecosystems. Number two is that uh, some of the PICTs, they are what we call they're in a state of a constant state of recovery or a constant mode of recovery because of recurring episodes of cyclones and droughts and floods. And so all these events keep on happening time and again. So they are never able to actually be in stable condition. Number three is that around 70% of the total gro uh, gross cropped area in the PICTs it is located in such a way so as to benefit from the summer rain. So this means that most of the area is rain fed. And you can imagine the climate change because it is going to bring about changes in the rainfall patterns. Uh, that is why uh, the, 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 the agricultural sector is uh, going to get a huge flow. Uh, another important uh, point is that the land holding size in the Pacific is very small, around about, uh, let's say, one hectare or less than that for most of the households. And, uh, Food accessibility and people's uh, accessibility to food are the first to be affected following any climatic disaster. And these are some of the observed climatic trends in the Pacific. Uh, number one, we see that there has been an increase in temperatures uh, to the tune of 0 0.6 to 1 degrees centigrade since the year 1910. And uh, there has been an increase in the number of hot, uh, I can say warm days and warm nights. <coughs> then, uh, if you look at the, the well, the, uh, the cyclone scenario here, you see that there has been a doubling of, let's say more than doubling of uh, the incidences of category four and five uh, cyclones across the Pacific. And uh, last of course is the sea level rise of uh, 0 0.77 and in four years. Now these are on the economic valuation of the incurred losses to the agriculture sector across the Pacific. 
Uh, the reason, of course, is Cyclone Winston, which caused a loss of US dollar 104 million to Fiji. Uh, now let's talk about climate change impacts in Pacific agriculture. Uh, the first is, of course, uh, intense cyclones and storm surges, which are responsible for soil erosion. Now, it's not just soil erosion in the inland areas. We're also talking about soil erosion in the coastal areas, uh, which cause lots and lots of damage to mangrove ecosystems. And you know, there are lots of communities. Uh, their survival depends on the mangrove systems. Uh, they depend on species like pandanus and on the uh, collection of crabs and other such uh, smaller species for their survival. So their livelihood is at stake. Nutrient depletion and damage to agricultural crops. Then rising sea level, which causes salt water intrusion and soil salinization. And of course, the proliferation of new and exi uh, existing and new species of pests, insects, and diseases. And of course, floods and droughts are another major cause of concern. Now, these are some of the, uh, some of the impacts of climate change which are uh, likely to occur or have already occurred. For example, in Fiji, where uh, most of it is sugarcane. Uh, rising temperatures uh, will be responsible for low sucrose contents, one. Second, they'll be responsible for poor sprouting and emergence of sugarcane. So this is something that is uh, a major cause of concern in Fiji. But the wild groundwater salinization has uh, compromised the cultivation of uh, giant swarm taro. And uh, this is one species that can survive in marshy areas for a very long period of time. Even for 30 years, it can remain as such. So it's, it's one of the species which is uh, considered very resilient to climate change. Uh, rather, your, the root crops are one of uh, those categories of crops which are among the most resilient to climate change, which is uh, why, because if in case there's a drought, the root crops will be able to survive even if the crops at the surface, like for example, pulses and wheat and rice, they'll be the first to go, but the root crops are those which will be able to survive. Uh, Kiribati drought has caused a decline in quality and production of breadfruit and coconut. For Palau, there is declining tarot production because of salinization and salt water intrusion. And for Vanuatu, we see that uh, prolonged drought has resulted in higher incidence of taro beetle and sweet potato beetle. This uh, taro beetle is also a serious cause of concern for Fiji. So, Drought may trigger uh, rising incidences of taro beetle attack. Uh, potential impacts of climate change in Fiji. In the absence of any suitable adaptation strategies, we find that there could be a damage ranging from US dollars 53 million to 52 million per year by the year 2050. Uh, with a two to four degree centigrade rise in temperature, the overall change in agricultural welfare will be in the range of minus five to plus four US dollar per year. Uh, now I want to talk about the transition from the traditional to the modern food system in Fiji. The traditional food system in Fiji was uh, a system that focused on intercropping and also talked about diversification and yield augmentation. But this traditional food system has now been replaced by the modern food system. In traditional food system, we also find that there are traditional food preservation techniques like the pit preservation method, okay, which is not so now because we have refrigerators and other things to look forward to. The transition happened because of the following factors. Number one is European contact. Number two is uh, the cessation to uh, UK and of course indentured laborers coming into Fiji uh, to work in the sugarcane plantations. World War II and urbanization and of course migration from rural to urban areas. The modern food system is, uh, it, it, it talks about decreasing self-sufficiency and increased reliance on exports and of course nutritional degradation and there's also a preference for less labor intensive staples like cassava and sweet potato. And the last of course is agro deforestation that is the replacement of agroforestry systems by uh, monocultures like sugarcane and coconut. But if you know that uh, if, if, if at all a natural disaster strikes, the, the agriculture sector gets a deathly blow. Why? Because the sugarcane industry, okay, which, uh, which uh, uh, if you talk about the arable land in Fiji, it's 16%. And say, around about 75% of that arable land is under sugarcane. So it gets, uh, it gets badly affected, and that is why the livelihoods of people are compromised. So we need to look towards answers for uh, this problem. How can we make the sugarcane industry more resilient to climate change? Maybe introduce agroforestry species? And that too, let's focus on the native species. Let's not talk about the exotic species. It's much better to focus on species like iri and pavola and breadfruit 
uh, pandanus species that are already existing here because they are uh, the actual answers to the problem, not introducing species from other countries. Climate smart agriculture, uh, I think this is a, a concept that almost everybody knows here. Among the land use strategies which can promise a synergy between food security and climate change mitigation is agroforestry. Uh, agroforestry talks about adaptation on the one hand and mitigation on the other. And uh, I now talk about some challenges and barriers related to adoption of agroforestry. Number one is farmers do not prefer to raise trees because they have a long rotation period. Number two is the land tenure system in Fiji, which is again, a uh, it has a big question mark, I'll come to that later. Marketing will produce lack of awareness, access to improved planting material, capacity, and knowledge. Agroforestry policy for Fiji should focus on all these aspects, tenure security, extension, marketing, incentives, R&D. Number one, tenure security. Now, uh, expiring land leases are a big problem in Fiji. Nobody wants to go in for a long term capital <coughs> investment because land leases are about to expire. So what can we do about it? Maybe let's talk about uh, aligning the two main institutional arrangements that exist in PG. One is ARTA and the other is NLTA. But they are always in a sort of conflict with each other. The uh, TLTB, uh, the Tokyo Land Trust Board, says that they are more prone to follow NLTA rather than the provisions of ARTA, which is considered to be more tenant friendly rather than the Matakali friendly or the landowner friendly. If you have looked at the provisions of the two, there's a huge discrepancy between the two. So we need to realign the process. Arthur talks about minimum 30 years lease. NLTA says that no, we're going to give leases only for 5 to 10 years. Arthur says that uh, let's talk about choice of land utilization. It has to be tenant friendly. But NLTA says that it has to be stipulated in the act. Uh, in terms of renewability, Arthur says that we are not <coughs> going to uh, renew beyond 30 years. But NLTA says that we can renew provided it gets consent, uh, consent from NLTB. So the provisions are highly <coughs> divergent. Uh, okay, so we need to. I'm sorry. No. So we need to. So we need to align the provisions under the two acts and bring them under one. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so we need to align the provisions under the two acts and to bring them under one roof, under one umbrella. So that is what policy, uh, uh, what the agroforestry policy should focus on, in one sense, uh, making the system of land leases more farmer friendly, more people friendly, rather than creating unnecessary conflicts. In terms of extension, uh, well, we need to talk about capacity building and, of course, confidence building. You can't tell a farmer to raise a species that has been uh, doing well in South America or Canada. They're not bothered about that. They're bothered about what is there in the field that is already existing there and what is going to actually cater to the livelihood demand. So we need to think along these aspects. It's very easy to talk about policies in closed doors and five-star resorts. Policies are made out there in the field, among the people, among the masses. Uh, another thing is we need to talk about wider use of demonstration plots. We need to show to the farmers that this is the way to do it, rather than just telling them, uh, rather than telling them about uh, you know high-profile research works. Uh, marketing. We need to establish storage facilities, transport infrastructure, well-developed markets for agroforestry products. Uh, I want to focus a bit on incentives, which talks about the establishment of nurseries. Most of the problems that farmers are fa facing today is with respect to adequate planting material. They don't have adequate planting material. The, the quality of or the genetic, genetic stock they have is of poor quality, is not high yielding. Access to credit and microfinance, and of course financial incentives and payment for ecosystem services. I'll give you, I'll give you three uh, small examples. One is the contract tree farming example, which has been very successful in Tamil Nadu, India. It talks about pulpwood-based contract farming system. So uh, basically, the industries are providing farmers everything. They're providing them planting material. They're providing them facilities for felling and transport. They also provide them uh, help for repaying the loan. And they also have a, a, a link with financial institutions, which are providing credit to farmers. Uh, the next is the Sufala Community Carbon Project, which is uh, giving agroforestry contracts to people in the Mozambique region in uh, South Africa. Now, this project uh, focuses on uh, uh, two aspects. One is agroforestry payments to farmers, and the other is uh, a community trust, which is actually meant for the benefit of the community. <coughs> there are the following agroforestry options for farmers. They can choose any, homestead planting, uh, acacia dispersed interplanting, glyrosidia dispersed interplanting, non-burning of agricultural residues, 
field boundary planting, mango orchards, cashew orchards, woodlot creation, but you have to manage them in such a way that you're not actually burning your farmers because that's going to cause uh, emission of CO2 into the atmosphere. It's more about the conservation of the Miombi uh, woodlands in the area, and uh, it's also a way to uh, make uh, payments to farmers for uh, the foregone alternatives. Uh, then uh, agroforestry contracts in Costa Rica, uh, we find that um, it, 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 in Costa Rica, uh, agroforestry initiatives have been incorporated in 2001-2005, and uh, they have uh, signed nearly 30,000 contracts which cover eight, uh, 800,000 hectares of forest, and they have distributed US dollar 280 million to farmers, which is quite a lot. Which is quite a lot. 4.4 million trees have been planted under agroforestry alone. And if you have a look at what I've highlighted in red here at the bottom, it says that if you're going to prefer native tree species and species which face the danger of extinction, then we're going to pay you more as compared to raising any, just any random tree. So that's what we need to focus on. Let's promote the indigenous species rather than promoting species like pine and mahogany, which are actually not meant to be here, which were never meant to be here. Uh, so that's it. Uh, I think uh, I will just wind up the presentation. Uh, policy implications, we need to create better markets for people. Uh, for example, for Santalum uh, Yasi, which is uh, the, the indigenous uh, Sami wood found here, there's no actual uh, proper market for that species. So if farmers are raising it, they have nowhere to actually sell the produce. So uh, that is also responsible for uh, non-preference of agroforestry systems among far farmers. We need to have uh, well-developed markets for uh, the marketing of coconut, which, which, is, uh, which has been, it has, uh, the furniture of coconut is, is, is very good. And the furniture of bamboo is also, is, is also a, good, a good option. For example, Pacific Green, they're making f furniture out of bamboo and cane, and they're selling it off at uh, such exorbitant prices. We need to have well-developed markets where people can actually sell their produce. They have nowhere to go. Number two is we need to boost investment in the agriculture sector. Number three is land management is vital to improving productivity. So let's talk about soil conservation, whether through vetiver or whether through um, uh, some other uh, species which, which can help in soil conservation. But let's focus on land management. Uh, policies need to reflect the fact that PICTs face differing vulnerability with respect to the food security issue. Uh, then we, we have to recognize the value of exports and of course limit uh, the import capability of uh, the import scenario of those PICTs. And uh, the last is we need to recognize the fact that strength and resilience of smallholder traditional crop cropping systems is very important and we need to ensure extension approaches to support them. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shikha. And I think that is per perfect to lead into our um, next sort of question in time. Just before we do so, I just want to give a quick recap. Um, today, I guess, climate change and education, climate change, adaptation, but it's climate change, adaptation, and education. Yeah? For so long, the discourse on, on climate change has been doom and gloom. I guess in the media, you know, sea level rising, the intensity of storms. It's all very, not, not, not something that we all look forward to and for our future generations. I guess what Shipra and the, and the team and the panel have given us today is that it's not all doom and gloom. The story out there is that um, there are solutions out there. We can be innovative um, through policy, through uh, different agricultural methods, through the ISAAC initiative. Um, well done, Tess, for, for that initiative. Um, and especially, um, like Morgan was talking about, um, educating our young leaders. Um, that is probably the way to go, to go forward. It's a multi-sectoral problem, and it should be addressed across all sectors. Um, innovative in policy, science, and technology, and the whole lot. So on that note, I know that there are a lot of questions. So, um, just come up here, please. <laughs> to answer the many interesting questions that we will get from yes. I have three questions. Uh, I'd like to thank the panel for their presentation. I have three questions. 
Uh, two for tests and one for Morgan. Uh, the two for tests, one, uh, from a practical perspective, what jobs are we preparing um, the persons who will graduate from the vocational programs for? Um, because one of the, the values of vocational training is that you can easily convert it to cash. You can find a job, you can get paid for that job. So from a practical perspective, I wanted to find out about that. Uh, the second is if there is any consideration of how these skills will, will move across the region, um, what mechanisms there are to, to facilitate the easy movement of these skills across the region. And for Morgan, when students are assigned to the delegations, what roles are they playing? Um, because from my experience, if they're not already in the civil service on these delegations, they will play a very minor role. So I just wanted to know about the quality of the experience when the students are assigned to delegations. Thank you. Um, also, uh, just a reminder, when, when you pose a question, can you just introduce yourself, please? I'm Stacy Robinson. I'm a PhD student at the Australian National University. Um, thanks, Stacey, for the questions. Any questions about PACT that is exciting, because um, it is. So in the um, development of the certificates, the graduate profile is actually the start of the development. So the first point of the start is what will the people that, that obtain this certificate be doing? What is it that we're expecting them to want to do at the end of the day? Um, and as you quite correctly pointed out, TVET is a very focused on work skills and it's a work-focused industry. Uh, so the discussions were had at the ISAC meetings and the certificate one and two levels, uh, perhaps employment, um, perhaps not. Perhaps the, perhaps the certificate one and two in resilience are people in the villages who input into committees, the village committee systems that occur in the Pacific, where those village committee systems actually inform uh, development partners and government agencies, provincial offices, district offices that look to obtain information on the food, the water, the situation of the village. Uh, so the certificate one and two in resilience may not actually lead to a full-time working position. Uh, the certificates are three and four. The, the work scenario was always working in an environment that would support the future of development partners using government agencies to obtain information on resilience. So the, the people from, these, from the, the graduates from those certificates, one to four in resilience, there was a definitely a focus on where are these people going in the employment sector. And of course it's unknown, <laughs> but that was a number one priority. And in the energy sector, it's a little bit easier because the people from the energy sector are, are there saying, we need, and again, sorry for the not the good language, but we need a, a trades assistance to have a certificate one and two. And once the person, and there was a lot of discussion on a certificate three in New Zealand, Australia will get you to a different position where a certificate three in the, in the Pacific will. And, and so we never, we, we definitely always try to keep it, this is in the Pacific, what are these people going to be doing? A, a good example is in Australia, New Zealand, a certificate one will not get you into a working situation. Whereas in the Pacific, it will. So, so um, thank you for that question. The second one's a little bit harder. Um, <laughs> so the mobility of the skills across the region, how will that happen, was your question? Um, yeah, well, of course, it's untapped. It's, it's one of the goals of the regionalism, and it's the framework of regionalism that, that wants to promote this. Uh, the, the, the approach that we're taking is that the regional qualifications will allow people to, and I, I didn't go into these details, that. It may be that you don't actually complete a qualification. You may only do what we call a skill set. 
you may only do a few competencies that, that allow you to perhaps go to another of the Pacific regional countries and perhaps you could take up further learning. There's no issue with that because of the regional flavour. But it's the, it's the recognition from the industry that's very important in this development, that industries across the Pacific have had input, they're aware, so they know that a person that's done this skill set and they did it in Samoa, they're, they're doing a program where they're, they're, they're now working for a, a, a regional um, agency, Pacific Power, and they're moving to Fiji for temporary, it's, it's certainly not trying to drain the employment out of the Pacific countries. Um, so that's how we envisage that it will, it will happen at this point, but hopefully it's, a, it's something that will be developing. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. Um, when the students are abroad is training, we allocate them to res their respective country delegates. They're actually from those countries. Like, if a student is from Fiji, then he or she is part of the Fiji delegate, Fiji delegate, and the same applies to other countries. And uh, the, the students will normally be already be equipped with the, the position of those respective countries and the Pacific together, like we, we've gone through the position papers for, by PIDF as part of the Super Declaration on Climate Change, as well as the Foreign Secretary, as, as well as the, the draft negotiating text, which will be negotiated at the COP. So the students have already gone through all those different tracks within the text. So if a student is doing his master's or PhD in loss and damage, then he will be following up that particular negotiating track within their respective uh, delegate. But one of the students who went through our training and went to the COP is here with us. So if I can give her the, the chance to speak about her experience. Okay, maybe I can just speak if everyone can hear me. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Dr. Morgan, and thank you, Stacey, for your question. I, wanted, I think the main um, focus of this program was for us to provide support to the delegation. So in terms of impact, what we did was we went, a lot of the times, they would have parallel meetings and negotiations. So our main job was to go in, take notes, provide feedback to our leaders of the delegation, and then they could then decide where to go from there. But for us as students, and for me personally, it was more of a capacity building exercise. So we were able to develop our skills, and we were able to go in and see it, how negotiations work, so that once we've graduated, we can go into these sectors and provide um, constructive work for our region. I had a couple of questions. Let's just follow up on what Stacy asked of the um, competencies and skills these people who do a uh, certificate and so on, um, and then some is also at the tertiary sector. But but you know one of the things which I mean, having worked for government and um, regional organisations here, there is a huge shortage of people who can do simple vulnerability assessments, who are able to. Um, look at a, a situation and sort of say, well, look, this is the sort of vulnerabilities in particular sectors. These are some of the adaptation to climate change, to adaptation options, mm -hmm. and they and also probably help um, put up a story so that they can write some concepts or proposals which can then lead to funding and, 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 and adaptation, and it's called adaptation planning, and later on, as you know, uh, getting funds to actually implement adaptation uh, projects and so on. Now, if, if the students, if this people who got this certificate had those sort of skill set, then the movement across the region, I mean, it's universal. Mm -hmm. They can use that skills anywhere. But I'm just sort of curious as to whether they would be able to, to do that, because there is, in the adaptation area, a huge, huge gap in terms of the requirements for scientific technical assessment, which will underpin uh, projects which will be our passport to getting this all these billions of dollars you heard about available for adaptation financing. Uh, it's just, you know, I'm, I'm just so curious as to how, I know you're just starting it, but you know, how it will all pan out. Again, uh, I, wish, I wish everyone here had been part of the development of these um, 
qualifications because that have, that has been a discussion. The, the training needs and, and gap analysis that was done in the 15 countries in the first year identified exactly what you've said as the number one priority. The number one priority was that we need people that are able to support the, the submissions and the way that we gather the information in order to, to obtain the funds and work with the development partners. So you may have seen that in the resilience streams, one of the streams, well, there's, there's a few that are not, not glaringly like, there's water management, sure, but there's also project management and there's also tourism and project management was, um, was very much up there. But uh, the other aspect to remember in these certificates is that they are certificate level so certificate level one and two, uh, back to the where are these people going, they're more likely to be giving assistance and support um, because the, the, the definition of what a person can do, their skills, they would be expected to be working under some type of supervision. Uh, it would be a certificate level four that you may expect a person to take on a responsibility and some independence and actually progress to that person that, that you've described. On the vulnerability assessment, there's a skill set, particularly for community vulnerability um, uh, assessments. So uh, and the integrated vulnerability assessment is, um, is, there's a lot of work being done on that in Fiji and that's been able to feed into the development of competencies for that in particular. Thank you. Um, I guess it's been discussed a lot that capacity building in the city usually isn't always about upskilling skills. It's also about putting more bodies on the ground. Um, in some of these countries, with the environment departments, there's the counterpart is about two or three people. And if they're away on a conference, I mean, the more people that you, you get, um, aware about these issues then, and I think that that is a worthy achievement. Next question, please. Can you hear me? Uh, before I, <coughs> I ask my question, uh, I want to introduce myself. My name is Seone Florecio. I teach here at the uh, USP, at the School of Economics. But I come from the very remotest island in the Kingdom of Tonga. Uh, New Atop Tabu and Tafahi. And uh, when I heard about this uh, resilience, I really want to come and ask this simple question. Is there any person from my island involving in this TVET program, especially the resilience uh, program? So I, <coughs> my question is, what is the entry requirements? I, I understand there was a program in the uh, SPC where the, uh, there was a training program where they bring people from the community and train them for three months. Uh, and then they get this, they get and they go back to the community. Are you involving or expecting uh, involving this? Because that, that the resilience, it should be triggered down to the people on the grassroots level. People who are suffering day and night, day and night, uh, wondering what is going to happen to their life tomorrow. Uh, to support that, uh, I think there's a very good program called a barefoot training in India, where they take women from the village to India and train how to use solar. Mm -hmm. And then when they come back, they go to the village. I think Tonga has been, and they are, there's not only resilience, but sustainable level. Are, are you thinking of venturing into that kind of uh, allowing, like myself, people from my community to come in and be part of. It's not so much the training as the chair said, upskill, but making people, uh, many people to participate as possible as we can. And the other part two of my question for those two is the intellectual property, intellectual knowledge. Some of these people in the Pacific, and we have lived for so long in the Pacific with hurricanes and we have ways of dealing with those. We read the stars, we read the sea, we taste the sea, whether it's mm, tasty, uh, salty or not, and then we are expecting that things are come. Are you going to include that in your program of resilience? Mm -hmm. And my, I do apologize, <coughs> my third question is for the lady, the last presenter. Very well done and very well informative and 
But I have this problem. Now I live in Fiji uh, for 14 years now, and I live in a place called Nepal. Um, <coughs> this is about policy. We can't stop. We have to face it. People from coming to the village to, Su uh, to Suva and to the Apple centers to see better lives. But they bring with them the cropping. <coughs> Most of them, they come with the skills to plant. And just lately, like, about three months ago, <coughs> I look at the, the where I stay, they are still the, the, to the roadside. It's about three meters to the roadside of grass. And I heard the Prime Minister of Fiji, if you have some land, you plant. <coughs> but there's a problem. I plant about five rows of cassava, and she test for my food security. And then when the council came, the council workers to cut the grass, they pull all the cassava. <laughs> My question is, if, would there a change in policy? Because the council said, don't plant beside the road. <laughs> but the grass will stay there all the time. Imagine this. If everybody is about three kilometers from the main road to the end of the small settlement, and there is a lot of grass there, and if we plant cassava, the family will look after the patch of cassava. You don't need to spend money again to come and cut the grass. They still have food. And if we can plant, and they can somehow, some family will harvest and contribute to the supply of cassava in the market. But that's only cassava. I, I have to stop there. My <laughs> question is, yeah. would you want to <laughs> no, policy yeah. changes? Can we change the policy? If I ask you to support me to change the policy, ask the council to plan to support Thank you. Thank you, Shirley. Um, just before we move on, just, just some guidance on that question. Um, obviously, it's about uh, existing. Did you look at the existing systems and did you integrate it into formation of your Isaac? Yeah, th thanks for that. Um, thank you for your questions. And um, the, the answer is, is there anyone from your island, uh, sorry, the question was, is there anyone from your island actually part of the Resilience Isaac? Um, I definitely can't answer that question. <laughs> I definitely don't know that. Um, there are some people, not a lot, from the very remote outer islands. The, the programs and the training that's needed in the, in the very remote outer islands, this particular project will not address that. This particular project is only working through established training institutions and, and focused on formal training. But if I can just say that it is also going to lead to many development partners taking up what has been developed and hopefully doing exactly what you're saying the need is. But in, in this particular project, we won't be bringing that, that the training to your particular island. That's mm. that's not envisaged in this program, um, <coughs> but it will feed into that in the future. And there's been some training done in the provinces in Vanuatu um, on this particular project in, at the certificate one and two in resilience as 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 a pilot. And we we paid for people to come in and do that training, but the money is not in this project to actually do that. Mm. Um, so it's, it's formal training, it's not informal, is, is the project. And, and the other question you asked, traditional knowledge, um, there was a lot of debate actually whether traditional knowledge was going to be a stream on its own. It was so important. It was what, what was that, that, was, that nearly got a Guernsey as an actual strand sitting there on its own. <laughs> uh, instead, every competency, every competency has an element or some evidence that's required that the person um, is able to demonstrate that they've got knowledge of how traditional knowledge in the local community will input into whatever that might be. Uh, and, and it has been a very important consideration. Would you like to respond to the second question? do exist uh, if uh, if you are to uh, if I'm to give an example I interacted with one of my students who's working in uh, the forestry department and he's actually involved in the harvesting processes here 
So uh, when you're actually harvesting a particular area, you have to conduct what is called as an EIA, Environmental Impact Assessment, uh, which is basically carried out by the Ministry of Environment. Uh, but um, they actually give it on contract to some other uh, independent body. And in most of the cases, they rule in favor of the harvesting operation. They ignore it, all the impacts, the primary, tertiary, secondary, all are ignored, and they simply uh, vote in favor of the particular harvesting contract. Uh, sustainable uh, vegetable using animal manure. This is a very simple, anyone can do that. So I was wondering if you can explore and tell us more information about that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. As, uh, you have asked something related to sustainable agriculture. Actually, we have been practicing agriculture and uh, there are impacts now. So impacts like uh, on yield. Sustainability is not there. Yield is, uh, we can increase yield, but no, there may be rate of increase may be less, less and less. Because we have been using fertilizers, pesticides, is there? So we are shifting towards the that you have already mentioned that manures we can use. Everyone can prepare at home and can be used for the agriculture purpose. Uh, in that case, uh, we can use. There are different manures are available. You can we have compost. We can have farm behind manures. The thing uh, is that. Uh, the concept is taking us towards the organic farming life and uh, whatever is available at your farm, we have to use that. Uh, we are not going to purchase any input from outside that will defeat our purpose. So whatever, uh, whatever we have, we can produce at farm, our farm, we have to use that for sustainability point of view. And uh, there are plenty information available on this. So we cannot discuss within one, two minutes like that, no? So, and may I try to much is there something more? I would like to add to that. Um, well, all farming in the Pacific has been organic. It was organic once upon a time. It was only with the introduction of pesticides and fertilizers and all such uh, chemical inputs that it became inorganic. So now again, the trend has been uh, the move towards organic. But if you look at the supermarkets and there's something of the likes of organic, it's always very highly priced, not with enough pockets. Something that would be normally costing you $2 would be costing you $10 otherwise. So uh, I think we need to look into this issue. How can we ensure that the organic products are within the reach of the common people? How do we ensure that our systems become organic? The, tra the transition has to move back from the, uh, the, the, the inorganic concept to the organic form. So that will only be there if proper information dissemination is there and uh, uh, the capacity building of communities is there, like uh, uh, examples of vermicomposting. Uh, people don't know about it, OK? Uh, p uh, examples of uh, green manuring, mulching. These are simple things that people can do at their own level in their own farms, but uh, lack of information. And uh, the promotion of inorganic, the promotion of NPK fertilizers and insecticides and pesticides and the hue and cry that is created, uh, you know, regarding uh, 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 infestations of diseases and pests. I think it's more of a hue and cry. The organic farming concept is much better and should be back in practice rather than promoting the inorganic concept. Very, very quickly, um, at the meeting in Nandi for the regional endorsement, a senior Ministry of Education official was present, I think, from either 12, I, I'm trying to count, maybe only three countries, but there was an education person um, in attendance also. And the just a reminder, I, I think I've probably been using the word qualifications to try and speed up the process of explanation, but their competencies stand alone, their skill sets, more than one competency. Take whatever you want, put it in your existing secondary school program, or take a whole certificate. It's up to the country to decide what they want to do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Adina Malarua from uh, FNU. Um, I just have three very brief comments to make. Um, in my just under 40 years of experience in the universities, um, uh, I have always found that uh, TVET is almost like the poor country cousin of education. Um, and uh, I've never, I'm looking forward to seeing the day when we will have a Ministry of Education and TVET. Now, in order to push TVET uh, to the level which it requires, it requires a lot of political will and leadership uh, uh, within the government 
and also among the senior bureaucrats who basically uh, draw up the budgets of the respective um, line ministries. And, um, and, and I think that um, uh, taking the Fiji government, for example, the focus now of the Fiji government is on job creation, not job seeking. Now, when they continue to impress that statement over and over again, it basically means that for us at the universities, we are now then um, required to relook at our programs to continually make sure, at least for, for FNU, that it continues to be relevant and responsive to the mandate in the FNU decree. Now, um, I'm very proud of my FNU CAF uh, presenters here today because in the trade certificates and diplomas and in the higher ed, ed certificates and diplomas and degrees, this is exactly what they're doing, backed by a very strong research component. Um, and, and, and what it means is that for us who are college deans, as we look at the kinds of programs we need to uh, put forth, uh, I'm, I, I like to think outside the box, and I like to, th uh, to, to move where, um, uh, move away from traditional program constructs. So I'm saying to my um, heads of schools, I want a BSc in international social policy. I don't want a BA, I want a BSc. Because in, 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 in a BSc, it means that you combine key components of qualitative as well as quantitative. And so your units will cover things like um, uh, quantitative economics, uh, maybe social or forensic accounting, um, international trade, um, uh, social policy, democracy and governance, statistics. And what it begins to tell us is that when we are trying to address the key issues that we have in front of us, the disciplinary boundaries slowly become fused when we move into a holistic and multidisciplinary spatial arena. And, and I think uh, that, that is the thing that is becoming more and more obvious to us. Um, and, and I think the TVET is an important uh, component, especially of, uh, of uh, small island countries. Um, the latest educational statistics that I've seen uh, basically tell me that of the 130,000 that pass through the primary schools in Fiji, only about 50,000 end up in secondary and about five to 7,000 in um, higher education institutions. In addition, the latest LANA exam results, which is the literacy and national assessment, um, uh, national exams, which were undertaken uh, among 7,000 primary school kids and in, four, in about 400 primary schools, showed the following result, that literacy is lagging amongst our children, and that there is a minor improvement in numeracy. So on the basis of that, I have basically decided to put together a research team from my uh, Department of Primary Education. Uh, we've had uh, the meeting with the Ministry of Education, we've got the endorsement, to look at enhancing literacy and numeracy levels. Um, and, and the point of origin is from primary schools. Basically because of this, there is an increasing number of non-speakers, non-writers, and non-readers of English who are passing through from primary through to secondary schools and who will find themselves out there. And so, we have a big challenge in front of us. In whatever advocacy and awareness programs that we are doing, if we have a cohort of students that are coming out that do not have the basic skills of literacy and numeracy, uh, then we've got a bigger, bigger challenge to deal with. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, do you want to say a question? We've got time for only two last questions. Uh, I'll be brief. I've been impressed by the presentations, which uh, I think outline well what we need to do uh, in order to adapt our agricultural processes uh, for climate change and so forth. And we've been told about a lot that's been done to develop the abilities to do it. Uh, there's been some 
oblique references to the costs associated with this. I am concerned that while we might have, uh, we might know what we need to do, we might have the ability to do it, we don't have the wherewithal to do it. Uh, the agricultural sector, I don't think, has the ability to self-fund the, the changes that need to be made. Uh, I'm not sure whether uh, funding agencies would consider the work to be adaption rather than innovation. The idea of adaption seems to be rather elastic. And attending yesterday afternoon's session on climate financing, uh, we were told there's not a lot of money about. Um, maybe it doesn't go to the best places anyway. Um, has the issue of how we're going to finance the changes needed in agriculture been addressed? Or what do we need to do to take this forward to make sure that the financing is available? Uh, maybe I can address this to the two ladies here who are in from yesterday's session as well as the panelists for today. Very slight input. I don't have an answer other than we're starting the process by training some people. <laughs> yeah, but, the, but that's the abilities to do it. I understand <laughs> that. I'll have to leave this to someone that's got more information on this. Yeah, let me give some reflections on. Uh, I think this. Uh, let's look at it from the Fiji's perspective. For you, you have a very exciting uh, program going on there. Um, uh, I'm seller anyway. I have been the uh, former UN Jeff National Manager for Fiji for the last eight years. Uh, uh, just by listening, um, please, I plea, project management has to be one of your uh, strong thrust in your TV. Um, yeah, because I'm currently also on a consultancy doing a UNDP small grant program. These are the community-based program. 100,000 Fijian per proposal. Another glorious gap that is coming up, those who conceptualize community level proposal to come up to NDP. They come in all sorts and strengths. Uh, what we, there is a totally disconnect between the aspirations of the UN level, say Jeff, GCF, and all the others, loss and damage is coming, and what we are trying to do and I see yours as coming. Let me illustrate for Fiji. If you can present to the Itaoke Ministry, uh, there's two past cycles of Jeff that we have uh, convinced uh, the Honorable AG to try to for us to diversify, to get away from the mainstream silo of the mainstreaming of Jeff when they go thematics, uh, for us to really bring up the issues on sustainable cities. My friend from Tonga has gone. I think that is just totally illegal, planting in those, uh, uh, because from my experience, from as a local, local government officials too. Um, but I see your entry point in, uh, because when you look at Fiji, we have 14 provinces. Your certificate one and, one and two, uh, sorry, three and four, the starting, the starting ones, can precisely go to those Rokotuis. And, and we have 1,172 villages. Again, there are potentials there for you to bring. It. And these are the ones who already littered already with certificate of attendance and all that. But uh, I'll give you something that we have. Jeff has fund all the conservation officers. That's an ITOK initiative. So currently, as we speak, we have 14 conservation officers. That just started last year. Then the, the drive there is to get into the 84 tickiness before we go right down to the 100 and the 1,172 uh, villages. So you, I, I gloriously see a huge potential for your TVET coming through there, but it has to come mainstream, like Andy has mentioned. Maybe to have a new and come through, of course. Uh, and uh, Jeff, we have pulled the arm to turn. <laughs> Uh, a component on KM so that all this funding can come rather than specifically uh, gone to the mainstream silo thematics of bio, uh, biodiversity, climate mitigation. Right now, when you talk Jeff, they don't talk adaptation, it's just mitigation. So there is a fight at that level for us to get all that. But we have successfully got the KM portion. 
to get a mix of that into a new one on KM. So for Fiji, we have uh, two big projects, $118 million about to roll on. We have successfully done for the KM, and hopefully that is a, uh, uh, a lucrative entry point for your project. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, Thanks, Chair. I just very quickly, I know you're out of time, yeah. um, but that's just so very relevant. Um, your 14 conservation officers um, are the people that we're trialling the RPL on for the vulnerability assessment. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're totally connected with them. But thank you for all, all that. Uh, I would like to get back to uh, your question. Uh, you talked about uh, where do we get the finances for this uh, fight against climate change. Uh, well, if you have a look at uh, most of the, uh, the financing that has been done for climate change, and if, if you look at CDMs, then most of it is in the energy sector and a very small proportion in the forestry sector. Uh, so uh, what can we do to make our, uh, uh, let's say, our agriculture systems more resilient to climate change? Where do we get the finances from? I, I, I gave the option of agroforestry. So um, uh, uh, in my presentation, I discussed the concept of industrial agroforestry, that is the industries like pulp and paper mills, instead of buying from big, buy big sellers, they can purchase their, uh, uh, the raw material from the farmers who grow, let's say, some uh, tree species on their farms. For example, uh, sugarcane industry, uh, okay, it, it gets uh, badly damaged by uh, cyclones and other such natural disasters. If you have trees along with uh, sugar cane, it will not just supplement income, it will also provide resilience to climate change. So, uh, uh, yes, of course, uh, when it comes to climate change and payment for ecosystem services and things like Red Plus, uh, it, it, it's, it, it's a kind of a competition among people. Uh, uh, people say that we are the most backward and we are the most deprived. Let's not talk about that. It's, mo it's got to be more about empowering your own self. How do you ensure that you have money there in your own pockets without looking to other sources? Yeah. So I, I think it's about, let, let's promote things like industrial agroforestry. Let's look, for, uh, let's look forward to options like contract farming, which will help in ensuring a better uh, a relationship between the buyer and the seller. So they don't have to actually depend upon uh, things like climate to you know, uh, actually uh, 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 sever the, the process. So it will help in ensuring a, a certain degree of uh, confidence between uh, the buyers and the sellers, and it will help in generating income for uh, the common people. So uh, yes, of course, it's a very complicated uh, question. There's a big question mark, where do we get the money from? But I think small initiatives will uh, help in the long run. Thank you very much, Shoka. I think on that note, at the risk of getting kicked out of this room for the next session, <laughs> <laughs> we're up here to grab some money. Thank you, everybody, thank for coming out. Thank you to them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.